morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Wade. I'm the team lead for community outreach in the natural resource industries for Esri here in Redlands, California. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this second in a series of webinars organized in concert with the Esri Mining User Group. This one's entitled, Explore the Power of Simple Mapping. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted in the next few days. As a participant, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to that recording. Now, I'm confident that many of you will have attended Esri Goto webinars in the past, and today we'll follow normal practice of encouraging you to enter questions as we go along in the Goto Webinar Questions dialog box during the presentation. We'll answer as many of those questions as time permits towards the end of the session. And as you probably figured out by now, I'll be your MC for the webinar. So now let's go ahead and introduce a couple of the guests that will join us today. First, I'm joined by my Esri colleagues, Peter Will, Principal Mining Account Manager for Esri, who's in Denver, Colorado, and Mark Smithgill, Senior Solutions Engineer, speaking to us from Texas. It's also my great pleasure to introduce you to Roger Bannister of Unimin from his office in Ottawa, Illinois, outside of Chicago, who's Principal Member of the Esri Mining User Group Committee. I've asked Roger to say a few words of introduction to the Mining User Group. Roger. Thanks, Jeff. Um, the Mining User Group is a group of uh, professionals in the mining community who work with GIS uh, frequently, and our goal is to advance the effective use of GIS technology within our industry. Uh, this is a good opportunity to uh, collaborate with each other as well as with Esri to help drive the development of new solutions to match our business needs. Uh, if you're not a member of the MUG already, uh, you can find us on LinkedIn. Uh, currently we have about 2,086 members uh, that have uh, joined over the last seven years. And our goal with this webinar is to, uh, or this webinar series, is to help drive business value with different Esri solutions. Um, and this webinar is uh, recorded and it's going to be available online later. Uh, and we also are going to have a, a pretty full day of presentations at the uh, Esri User Conference over the summer. So if you're able to make that, that would be a great opportunity to learn more about the MUG and to learn about what other people in the mining community are using. GIS for. Great, thanks Roger. Okay, with introductions complete, uh, let's get you quickly oriented to the agenda for today. Uh, the material that we'll cover was born out of a question raised by the mining user group about the increasing capability of ArcGIS Online. As many of you know, ArcGIS Online started life as a repository for base map data essentially that Esri manages largely on behalf of federal clients and exposes for public use. But over time, it's become so much more. As we discussed the content to cover in this webinar, we settled on the following agenda. So we'll start with a quick reference to some of the more important ArcGIS Online content that's available today, and some of the smart mapping capabilities to help in its cartographic representation. We'll cover capabilities of ArcGIS Online spatial analysis or ArcGIS Online based spatial analysis, some simple web maps and apps and templates that you can apply to that data. And then we'll have a quick look at Maps for Office and some simple tools that help you work with the spatial data for everyday office applications. Finally, we'll take a very quick look at delivering that same data to the simplest of the mobile apps, Explorer for ArcGIS. Perhaps then, most interestingly, Roger from Unimin, who was just introduced to you, will discuss how he's applying these capabilities to support some of his everyday workflows at Unimin. So now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Peter Will, uh, for the main presentation. Pete. Great. Thanks, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. My name is Pete Will. I'm Esri's account manager to the mining industry, and I'll be taking us through the slide portion of the webinar today. So when I think about the people that most utilize maps, I think of the GIS power user and the GIS professional. These users have a vast array of tools available to them to enable sharing and collaboration 
of GIS data across their organizations. But with the ever-expanding complexities of GIS systems, we often overlook the capability of enabling mapping for those within your organization that may not use maps daily. Enabling the non-GIS professionals will ut will util to utilize geospatial data in their daily workflows is a key component to a successful ESRI platform deployment. The presentation today will explore some key aspects of the ESRI platform and we'll discuss ways to enable stakeholders within the organization to level, le leverage simple mapping workflows and I'm also very confident that by using the approaches discussed today you'll be ensured the maximum return on your investment in our technology. So let's get started. <coughs> One advantage to using the ESRI platform is that users never have to start with a blank map. With our ready-to-use maps, users can focus on their specific business data and overlay that data onto a wealth of existing data layers. These data, data layers are organized into what we refer to as the Living Atlas. The Living Atlas includes hundreds of maps and layers that are available to us out of the box and ready to use. So all right, let's take a closer look to see what's available in the Living Atlas. First, the Living Atlas offers a wide range of reference maps for the context of your work. These reference maps are built from authoritative content and are presented in multiple card graphic styles. A user can select from a wide range of base maps, ones that best represent the data they are trying to display. Next, the Living Atlas contains imagery layers that can be added to any map. In talking with my mining customers, imagery always comes up as a key component of their workflows. But for many years, this imagery was available only from specialized vendors and, well, quite frankly, very expensive. But today, imagery is readily available, ready to use, all care of ArcGIS online platform. And imagery is now a core part of the Esri technology platform. Of special note is Esri's recent partnership with Digital Globe. This partnership brings both DG's Vivid and Metro products into the Living Atlas. In addition to the base maps, we include a wide variety of vector mapping layers. One example is the boundaries and places layers, which can be utilized in conjunction with your authoritative mining data. A quick search of the boundaries and places content discovered layers from the USGS, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, even the Office of Surface Mining, EPA, BLM, as well as a host of other agencies. The content from these sources included things like wetland boundaries, mineral resources, abandoned mine lands, even geologic modeling data, and a host of other valuable information, things I feel you can use directly in your work and your workflows. By combining this rich mapping content with specific business data, the platform gives the non-GIS professional the ability to create their own maps based on their own specific needs. This self-service mapping capability can immediately increase productivity as well as free up valuable GIS staffing resources. Users can discover existing content, combine it with existing maps, and then add their own authoritative content to generate useful information products and to help aid in their daily work. We have also included in the map making workflow the concept of smart mapping. Smart mapping analyzes your data and suggests the best way to represent it on the map. The user can then further style their maps by accessing the hundreds of settings available in the mapping platform. Security information is a concern for all of my mining customers and by implementing the named user security model you can control how these maps are stored and shared within the platform. 
This allows users to maintain their own key maps, share maps within their appropriate groups, and allows management of the content such that key information products can be shared with the appropriate stakeholders within the system. The platform also includes a rich set of administrative features that gives you complete control of the content and users within the system. You can assign custom roles and privileges to users so that access to the appropriate content is always controlled within the organization. And it's scalable. Regardless if the platform is designed for one or 1,000 users, it's designed to scale within your organization. Both from a licensing and an IT perspective, you can easily add additional resources to the platform to ensure that its growth matches your organization's adoption rate. This agile approach can be combined both as an on-premise or a cloud-based solution. Now we're going to show you a demo of what this self-service mapping is all about. We'll switch it over to Mark and he's going to demonstrate how to make some maps using the platform. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Pete. All right, so as many of, you, many of you are aware, we all have many types of spatial content coming from different departments, different teams, and different projects. So let's take a look at how you can start to organize that content to create some, some pretty simple maps to spread that information and, and share the information contained in that data throughout your organization. Here I have ArcGIS Online. So this serves as a portal of sorts to access spatial content. I do want to distinguish between ArcGIS Online, that's the cloud hosted, uh, and then Portal for ArcGIS, which is the, uh, the software you download and install behind your firewall. For all intents and purposes, the functionality is the same between the two of them. There's a few things I want to highlight on this page here. First, this would be skinned in your own company look and feel you would have your own company logo across the top here. Second, we have a ribbon of key maps and key applications across the bottom here. So this is where users can log in to access most frequently uh, requested different maps, maps in three clicks or less. And then lastly, I am signed in as myself. So this Mark 6309 identity will carry over to all the different maps and applications I make today as well as different applications we'll show you uh, on the desktop and in mobile devices. Content is organized and shared through groups. Now, I'm a member of these nine different groups. Typically, organizations create as many groups as they need to. They're typically organized under different projects, different uh, departments, different regional area of operations. Let's take a look at a specific project, this blast hole management project. So here I can see all the different data sets and services and maps that are uh, applicable to this blast hole management. I can see we have 11 different members in this group and I can start to filter this content depending upon what I want to find. If I have a particular map in mind, and I can search the portal as a whole at the top. So I'll search for land information map. And go ahead and open that. So the map viewer pops up with a, a basic web map. So we only have one layer in here. We have our, our leaseholds, our, our claim. So from here, we can start to search our organization for different data sets. So I know our geology department has a few services available to me. So I can search my organization and then add these to the map. Now I'll go ahead and start to adjust the symbology and transparency so I can see what's going on underneath the map. As I start to zoom and pan around, I can get a better feel for what's going on in this area of operations. I can change the base map to better suit my needs, so I'd like to take a look at some imagery. And I can see that the faults lined up with, loosely line up with the different ridge lines and, and geologic formations on the face of the earth. If I was interested in a particular area of operations, I can create a bookmark here. 
That'll, that will allow me to return to this point at a later time. From here, we can add other data sets that are available to us now. So let's take a look at the Living Atlas. So Esri works with many different federal, state, uh, and local agencies, as well as nonprofits to come up with different data sets uh, that are freely available to you now. So different types of imagery, many different base maps, demographics information, and landscape information. These are all freely available to you when you're signed into the ArcGIS system. So let's search for BLM and then add USA Federal Lands to our map. All right, now I'm going to zoom out, turn off my geology information, and apply a slight transparency to this federal land so I can see what's going on underneath it. And I'll change the base map back to the topographic base map. So in a few clicks, we've added information on our land department, our geologic department, and the Esri Living Atlas. But I know we have some geochem points available to us uh, that I'm not using. So I can search for them and add these to the map. All right, so I have many hundreds of different geopoints on my map now, and I want to start to filter these depending upon uh, what I want to show. So in this case, I'm only interested in gold. So gold is greater than one part per billion. And then I will apply that filter to these geochem points. From here, I can start to adjust the symbology. So I want to show gold, and uh, in this case, I want to create a, a quick little heat map on that. So here, this is going to show the highest concentration of gold uh, in, in my area of operations here. I can go back through and use smart mapping to come up with some intelligent choices for me so I can better uh, design a map. So we can come in here and start to uh, changes symbology here, so I like this rough color scheme, but we can apply transparency values to the individual values as well. So we're going to apply the transparency to the gold field, and high values will re remain lowly transparent, and then uh, low values are going to have a high transparency. So that, what that does is makes these areas where there's a high concentration of gold, that pops for us much better than it used to. So smart mapping helped us to bring our geochem points in, filter that, and symbolize that in a fashion so we can get the most information out of this as soon as we can. From here, let's perform some analysis on these points. So I'm going to run an interpolation tool on these geochem points because I can see that I don't have the lease for many areas around here. This is very disjointed, very uh, incongruent. So let's go ahead and see what type of uh, spatial analysis we can perform on these areas. There might be some areas we want to uh, pursue getting the lease for. So I'll rename the layer name to gold interpolation and run this analysis. This takes about 45 seconds. While we're waiting, let's take a look at some of the other spatial analysis tools that are available to us. So we can summarize data in, in these different ways. We can analyze patterns, so we're running an interpolation right now. We can do a density or hotspot analysis. We can plan routes. We can create drive time areas. All these tools are available to me with the ArcGIS platform. Of course, I can bring in custom tools too, uh, but these are freely available to us out of the box. And let's go back. And our geochem interpolation is just finishing up. So I'll go in here and start to adjust the symbology under colors and amounts. So here, doing that, I'll turn off federal lands and bring leases to the top. 
I can see that in this area, I do have the lease for this highly concentrated area of gold. But throughout this area of operations, we do not own the lease. So this is something I need to alert our land department so we can start to uh, pursue acquiring the lease to this area. From here, let's save this. Give it a few unique tags. And then share this. So this web map can be shared to my organization, to my portal, or to these different groups that I'm a member of. I can take it a step further and create a web app from this as well. So these different web application templates are also available to you with ArcGIS Online and Portal. You can create uh, your own custom web application templates as well. So under the summarized data here, I know we have a summary viewer tool. So let's go ahead and create this application. I'll give it a new title, and it's going to go ahead and take the web map I just created and open it into an uh, application wizard. Now I can see the exact web map I've been working with. Under the general tab here, I can give it a unique title. I can change the colors here if I want to. This is a very dynamic and interactive way to create applications. So uh, our motto over the last few months has been configure before customize. So what this technology allows you to do is create these simple fit for purpose applications without requiring a programmer to, to write hundreds of lines of code for you. Under the summary layer, this is where things start to get interesting. So I want to summarize the geochem points and I'd like to summarize gold and silver. So I'll save that and then launch. So what this tool does now is goes through and creates a summary viewer for me. Um, as you see across the bottom, this is a very dynamic and very interactive way to view my data. So I could see this summary of this roll-up changes depending upon my visible extent. So this gives me a really good way to view uh, at a glance continuous data uh, such as a, a gold assay. So let's go back to the web map. Not all of our data is uh, in the ArcGIS system already. So we have a CSV here, uh, some tabular data. Um, many of us use uh, spreadsheets and tabular data on a regular basis. So what we like to do is drag and drop this CSV onto the map. So you can see these eight points that were added, and Smart Mapping goes through and finds the variable and cr gives you an appropriate symbology to, to use. So we're going to change this to Commodity 1, and then click OK. So you can see in the lower left here, if I go up to the legend, uh, our ore veins are displayed on the map here. So when I click on them, I get just a, a pretty typical attribute table. We can go back in and customize these pop-ups depending upon what we want to show. So right now we're just showing a list of field attributes. Let's go to a custom attribute display. From here, we can go through and select the different fields that are in our data set and color the pop-up accordingly. So I'll click OK and save. And now when I click on the new gold assay points, I can see the pop-up that I just created. From here, I'll kick it back to Pete to talk about different ways of using your, your normal applications and how you can add uh, spatial data to them. All right, thanks, Mark. Well done. Appreciate it. Now we're going to have a, a discussion on the applications that are available with the platform. The platform offers a vast array of applications that are tightly integrated with these maps. 
The concept is that the apps are wrapped around the maps and allow users to easily access the powerful tools contained within the platform. Because it's easy to create new applications, we can start to move away from that, that kitchen sink type of a web app mapping application, the one that tries to include every function for every user. Now we can create very focused user experiences. We can tailor the application to perform only those functions necessary for that user's workflow and design it so they can pr perform their tasks in three clicks or less. This three click or less mentality increases the adoption of the platform and places the power of the GIS in the hands of more individuals within the organization. As you can see on this slide, we organize the applications into three distinct categories, field, office, and community outreach. The field applications cover the full range of tasks that a mobile workforce would need. It includes the ability to track work, navigate to locations, say, within and outside an active mine, and also to capture authoritative content at the source. The office applications extend the reach of the GIS beyond the traditional desktop GIS tools. These enable office workers to consume mapping information into business solutions that they use daily and enhance those workflows through geography. The community outreach application allows users to present their maps to a wider audience both within and outside their organization. One of these applications we would like to highlight today is ArcGIS Maps for Office. The Maps for Office app allows users to consume the content from the platform directly within Microsoft applications such as Excel and PowerPoint. This brings the power of the maps to the applications that the business user uses every day. For example, by visualizing Excel data on the map, we can gain critical insights to the business data which often tells a dramatically different story. Viewing data on the map instead of, say, in a table or graph, we can unlock key spatial relationships between data sets and bring valuable insights to the organization. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Mark to do a demo of Esri Maps for Office. Mark? Thank you, Pete. All right, so here I am in Excel. We use Excel on a regular basis. This is one of the most commonly used BI softwares out there. We get tabular information from many different departments, uh, surveys, uh, land, uh, updated lease information. Um, so what we've done is we've created an add-in that works directly within Excel. So when I log in, this will give me the same functionality that I just demoed in the web mapping software uh, directly in Excel. So this logs in with my Mark 6309 identity. So I have the same level of permissions that I had uh, within the portal itself. Now let's go ahead and add a map. I'm lucky enough to have data with the latitude and longitude coordinate directly in that. So when I add data to the map, it parses these data sets and picks the coordinate location type for me. If I was working in a local grid or if I didn't have any spatial information on here, I could use a custom locator to go ahead and uh, tie my information with an authoritative spatial location as authored by the GIS team. So I'm going to go ahead and symbolize these data sets. First I'm going to remove my selection. Then we'll try adding data again. And let's symbolize these by type. So we want to see all the different uh, underground or surface mines. So I'll add this information to the map and make this slightly larger. So I can pan and zoom and click, uh, same as I do in a web map, directly within Excel. If I want to get more information about a particular record or two, I can highlight that row and then see it exactly on the spreadsheet. 
So once I have information published uh, to a web map here, I can share this information as a map or as a layer. Um, but right now I'm going to take a step back and add information for my organization. So I'm going to pull the gold interpolation service that I just created. So this is that uh, interpolation, uh, the spatial analysis I just ran. I pulled information in from our portal. So as I zoom in, I can start to see uh, the percentage of, of gold in these areas and where we have mines uh, in these locations. So as I can present to our land team to say, hey, we need to start to pursue the leases to these areas, they know exactly where we're talking about. Now, oftentimes we use PowerPoint to present these. So let's go ahead and create a slide in a PowerPoint presentation. And I'll drag PowerPoint up here for us. So what this has done is created a, a static image uh, of our area of operations here from the map within Excel. So this is a static map. This is as old as it is as soon as I hit print screen. So let's go to our ArcGIS Maps tab and add a dynamic map here. So I'll follow this little wizard and this will guide me through how to add a dynamic map directly inside of PowerPoint. So I'm going to select the gold assay one web map that I just created and this wizard will step me through the process. So I'm going to leave all of my layers turned on Hopefully this loads. Here we go. This goes back through and reads all of the different types of data sets that I have in the map so I can choose what layers I want to be uh, made available uh, through uh, the Maps for Office interface here. So uh, we don't want bedrock geology or federal lands turned on, but we do want geochem points on. So as I continue through this wizard, we have a legend here. I can select a layout. So in this case, I want the map to take up the entire slide. And I'm going to click Next for that initial uh, load of this map and click Insert. So what that does is inserts a map directly in PowerPoint. So as I launch my presentation, we have a static map, a static image first. But let's go ahead and make this uh, interactive now. So this is loading the web map that I just created directly in my PowerPoint presentation. So as I progress through my PowerPoint, I can work with dynamic web maps right in PowerPoint. I have the same pop-ups that I created. I have the same pan and zoom ability uh, as I would in a web map in PowerPoint. Isn't that cool? All right. let's kick it back to Pete to talk about a third way of sharing information throughout an organization. Great, thanks Mark, well done. So, so far we've looked at uh, accessing maps uh, through a browser with self-service mapping and also integrating maps with back office solutions such as Esri Maps for Office. Now let's take a look at delivering that same data to some applications that are specific to your mobile workforce. The platform includes a whole suite of mobility applications tailored to specific uh, mobility use cases. We start with our workforce application. Workforce helps you manage field work assignments in a geographic context. You think of it as your quarterback of the mobile tools. From those work assignments, we link to the Navigator application. As the name implies, Navigator enables turn-by-turn -turn directions to any location including your own custom road networks within, say, an active mine or to remote sample and or drill locations. Once the field user reach their, reaches their destination, we have two applications that focus on capturing data in the field. The collector application, which is a geocentric capture tool, and Survey123, which is a more of a form-centric experience. 
We also include in the data capture suite our drone to map product. This allows us to process raw image, images from aerial drones and generate both 2D and 3D information products. And to monitor all these field activities, we utilize the operations dashboard. The operations dashboard is an application that allows you to view the progress of all ongoing field activities. But often we want to simply view maps when we're out of the office environment. The Explorer application, which allows everyone in the organization to access maps um, on their mobile device, and that's what we're going to take a look at today. So taking a, a closer look at Explorer for ArcGIS, um, as I mentioned, Explorer for ArcGIS was designed for those mobility workflows that require read-only access to the maps. Users can easily search, find, and mark up maps, and then share those markups with others, others within the organization. So we're going to turn it back over to Mark again, and uh, we're going to do a demo for Explorer for ArcGIS. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Pete. All right. As a named user in an organization, you have access to several different native mobile applications. Today, let's take a look at Explorer. So, right off the bat, I'd like to point out that I, again, I'm logged in with my Mark 6309 identity. So this is the same identity that I used to create the web maps within my portal the same identity used to create the web maps within Excel and PowerPoint. So from here, I can see the different groups that I'm a member of, the content that is available in each of these groups. I can go back through and see my maps, so the different maps that I have created that may not be shared. So here are the gold assay web maps that I just created. Let's take a look. So as I zoom in, I can start to see the different data and how it's displayed on the map. So this is uh, displayed in identical fashion as uh, what we just saw with Portal and Maps for Office. I can zoom in, click a point to get more information about that. So if I want to get information on the different veins or the interpolation, I can do that. This has the same custom pop-up that I just created when I drag and drop the CSV onto the map. And I can get information about the interpolation uh, analysis I ran a few minutes ago. When I scroll out and zoom to my area of operations here, I can start to mark up the map. So I can redline this area and say, why don't we have the least to this area? From here, I can share this map as either a static image or a dynamic link to this exact web map that I was using. So I can immediately provide feedback to uh, my supervisor or the people who need to know so we can get to uh, a decision as soon as possible. The ArcGIS platform allows me to bring in information from my land department, from my operations department, uh, from the Esri Living Atlas, I can drag and drop CSVs and perform spatial analysis and then share the results of that analysis in PowerPoint as well as mobile applications. And now I'd like to send it back to Pete. All right, great, Mark. Thanks again. Uh, well done. So now it's, it's my pleasure to reintroduce Roger Bannister and, and bring Roger into the conversation. Uh, as, as Jeff mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, Roger's talking to us from his office in Ottawa, Illinois. And we'll be uh, presenting some of them very good use cases of their ArcGIS online environment. Um, what we have shown you so far in this presentation is, is a fairly straightforward use case for ArcGIS online. But what I feel Roger will be presenting is, is Unimin's true uh, enterprise GIS solution for ArcGIS online. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Roger. Thank you, Pete. Um, I'll start with a, a little bit of background on Unimin Corporation. Uh, we are actually the North American division of the Sabelco Group, which has uh, hundreds of mines across the world here. 
and we produce a variety of industrial minerals uh, such as silica sands, uh, nepheline cyanite, and various types of clays uh, for a lot of different applications. Uh, my uh, purview is mostly over just the North America side of the world, mostly US and Canada, um, but I also work with our colleagues in, in Europe and Australia on uh, helping them use ArcGIS online. When we started down our um, enterprise GIS path, the, the central theme was that we needed to figure out how do we get, uh, how do we streamline map sharing with our distributed workforce? And I think this is a pretty common problem to a lot of mining companies. Uh, we have uh, corporate and en uh, engineering and geology departments that are uh, located off-site. We have uh, regional managers, uh, you know, who are constantly traveling, and then we have the people who are actually on the site, uh, and they all need to be able to share current relevant data uh, with each other. So as we started to look at how uh, ArcGIS would, well, which particular kind of ArcGIS solution would help us, uh, you know, you start looking at the ArcGIS server and online and portal and the, what you'll notice is that there's a wide array of different ways that you can put these pieces together, uh, which can be a little intimidating at, when you're first getting started, uh, but it allows you to really customize it to your particular needs. Uh, since we have limited IT resources uh, and a preference towards uh, software as a service and infrastructure as a service, uh, ArcGIS Online and a hosted ArcGIS server in the Amazon cloud uh, was a good fit for us. Uh, ArcGIS Online allowed us to uh, tie into our uh, corporate cloud on the Azure uh, to use single sign-on to manage identities, uh, which made that a little bit easier to administer things and, and increase their security when people leave the company and that sort of stuff. Um, our ArcGIS server that's on the Amazon cloud that's outside of our corporate network uh, it can still securely share map services through ArcGIS Online. Most of our online users are going to be read-only, and so we can securely cache credentials in between there and then run some scripts to change the passwords as needed. And the really nice thing we, we liked about ArcGIS Online was that it, it scales to our needs. So if we need to add some users, I just call up Pete and I you know, ask him for a quote for some more users. Um, so a lot of flexibility. But then once you get started, there's, there's an overwhelming amount of little details to, to consider. And uh, what we found is that the major things that we wanted to focus on was, was how are we securing our data? Um, how are we sharing it? What can people do with the data? And then what are we uh, posting as far as uh, you know, metadata in our items? Um, so security-wise, uh, the very first thing we wanted to do was make sure that we were only using HTTPS. I think when ArcGIS Online first rolled out, um, that was an option that was not on by default. I think if you started an organization today, I think that is on by default. Uh, and that helps with the security and, and anybody who is working in a cloud solution that'll, that'll make the IT guys happier. Uh, there's also an option you want to probably want to check that to disable uh, public sharing. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, the general user isn't going to accidentally share a, a confidential layer publicly. And then as I mentioned, having single sign-on, if you can turn that on, that's, that's really helpful as well. Uh, groups are the primary way that data is shared. So items are shared or put in a group and then users are made members of the group and uh, it's really good to consider the groups primarily in that security and sharing context rather than a, a browsing context because the search tools are, are really robust. Uh, so focusing on, the, on that security, the next thing you want to think about is how do you want to manage how groups are created and, and maintained. So uh, do you want to have a, a centralized uh, administrative group that creates the the, use, uh, the user groups, 
or do you want the end users to be able to make those groups themselves? Um, there's it, certainly advantages to either one of them. We decided to do it a little more curated and that helped us control the nomenclature and make sure that uh, we were setting up groups with sharing permissions the way we expect them to be. Um, another uh, critical piece is the roles. So you want to review pretty carefully all the different things that the, the different roles, the default roles are allowed to do. Um, as it pertains to groups, what we saw was that the default user role had the ability to create groups. So that was a place where we had to decide to, we had to create a custom role to make sure that that user couldn't do that. And then the last thing with items, um, it's a kind of a good idea to, to come up with some guidelines for what your expectations are for what people should put into the item descriptions. And you probably want to strike a balance between uh, being informative and being uh, overly verbose. Uh, so you don't want people to waste a lot of time populating it if it's not really going to help. But you, you want to have something a little more description, uh, descriptive than, you know, mind map. Uh, another strategy that, that was useful for us is uh, creating a, a, a user that's going to own all of the authoritative data. So uh, as, as Pete and Mark showed, uh, you know, you can create a map and you can set up the pop-ups and then you can save that layer and it could have a very similar name to your authoritative data. And so that's just one extra way to help make sure that, you know, when people are searching for things, that they see that authoritative data or authoritative user, they know that that's the right original data to use or that's the, the core layer to use. So I'm going to go through a few uh, examples of, of some applications that ArcGIS Online helped us uh, do. And, and I'm going to kind of start from big picture down to um, the site specific. Um, one of our early successes was using uh, the web app builder to configure a very simple web application for our sales team as they were going around to our energy customers. And this web map has a few layers. Uh, I'm only showing the our, you know, our terminals and, our, and uh, the shale plays, um, but they could layer in some extra information about drilling and, and where our customers' operations are located, and uh, as well as a 50-mile trucking distance from our terminals to show how we're uh, positioned in each market. And uh, that's really helpful. This web app builder made it very quick to set up, and since it's uh, offering a pretty limited amount of functionality, it only has the tools that the sales guys need. It's very easy to train people on how to use it. You know, another uh, good application for us was figuring out how, to how can we use ArcGIS to leverage other data that we're already generating in other uh, business intelligence systems. So uh, one of the things that we've just recently um, been working on here is getting our uh, competitor tracking information that our sales and marketing team is maintaining in Salesforce uh, into ArcGIS so that we can uh, display it on the maps. Uh, initially, you know, we had a handful of uh, marketing analysts who would want to look at the data and they would have to uh, you know, download a report off of Salesforce and plot it up and, and that got a little time consuming. Uh, so we were able to hook up the back end so that our Salesforce uh, application every night syncs up the data with our ArcGIS server in the Amazon cloud and then that data is shared up as a feature service um, on ArcGIS Online so that anybody who pulls up this map they know that that data is uh, up to date. Another um, Good application that we've been working on this last year is uh, with our land data and so obviously land is a very common challenge with uh, the mining industry and we used ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Server to create a centralized uh, nationwide uh, property boundary layer for um, the US and Canada here and then that's our authoritative source of data, we plan to eventually link that to other uh, documents related to our property ownership. 
Uh, but this allows our operations, my planning, you know, any, any users that are, no matter where they are or what application they're using, they can see the up-to-date property ownership information. So whether they're in ArcGIS Online like this or they could open that same map up in desktop uh, in the mobile apps or even the uh, ArcGIS for AutoCAD, our engineers can pull that up and to supplement their, their CAD designs. And going a little further in, we have uh, a site that's been working on testing workflows for blast mapping. So they, they're using this web map to help them with their blast uh, planning. And they, uh, they go and map everything out with their GPS and they uh, use ArcGIS desktop to edit a feature service that we are hosting on the ArcGIS server. And then we're sharing that feature service up through ArcGIS Online so that uh, as the operations team is planning their blast and executing them, they're keeping that data up to date. And then the off-site mine planners or geologists or regional manager can uh, pull up that same map and see exactly where the mine face is um, you know, as of that week. Um, additionally, this uh, having the ArcGIS Online platform with all the other apps, this allows the mine supervisor at the site to take this map with him in the field using the Explorer app. So if there's any questions about where they're located or where their next blast should be, you know, they have that option now. So in, in conclusion here, uh, ArcGIS Online has uh, helped us create that secure, centralized, authoritative data source. Uh, to enable collaboration on maps throughout our country, no matter where our users are located. Uh, the software as a service model uh, saved us time and money, made our IT people happy. I think our long-term expenses is lower with that kind of model. Uh, and uh, it also kept that cost for the initial startup. So if anybody was maybe had any doubts about how successful your uh, implementation is going to be, this lowers the bar for entry. So it was very good. Um, and then lastly, the, the whole suite of ArcGIS applications um, will provide us some additional opportunities to create value out of our data uh, that may otherwise just be locked away in, in PDFs or uh, on paper maps somewhere. So thank you, Alan. I'll hand it back to, uh, to Pete or Jeff here. All right. Thanks, Roger. Thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, sharing your story with us. And, and one thing that stands out to me about Roger's use cases is, is that they span several businesses within their uh, mining operations. And, and it's an e excellent example of using ArcGIS Online as an enterprise solution. And, and I just, again, want to thank uh, uh, Roger and Uniman for sharing their story with us. So I, I hope many of you have seen something today that you, you think would be valuable to you and your organization and that some of you might be wondering uh, how to bring these capabilities into your organizations. So we do have a roadmap that helps you get started or, or just helps you uh, increase your adoption of the existing platform. Um, this link uh, to the guide launching your location platform is on this slide. but. What might be easier is that you can contact me directly and I'll forward it to you. And again, it's Peter Will at pwill at esri.com. And as promised, um, we have some time for some questions and I'm going to pass it back to Jeff Wade and he's going to handle that, that part of this. Jeff? Hey, thanks guys. Uh, great job on the presentation. And we do have a little time for questions, and some have come in during the during the presentation. Mark, I'm going to come to you as a as I published online with the first question. Give Roger a chance for a breather, and then and then swap to Roger. Um, question about uh, named users in ArcGIS Online. Does everyone need to be a named user to get access to ArcGIS Online? Thanks, Jeff. So yes, that named user, that identity that carried through from the browser, from the portal, to Maps for Office, to the mobile device, uh, identity is key. So uh, yes, you do need a named user uh, to log in. Uh, that's how content is controlled and, and how publishing permissions are, are allocated. 
Okay, and, and a follow-up question to that. So, if I have a named user and I have access to ArcGIS Online capabilities, I can make use of them in the context of desktop GIS, right? Because we saw a lot of web today, but... Oh, yes, absolutely. So, uh, Pro, uh, one of our newer desktop applications, um, that has a very good interfacing between a portal and the standard desktop environment. So that allows you to publish and consume uh, content from your portal. Uh, and, and in order to do that, you need a named user so you can access uh, certain data sets that you might need that are on your portal. All right, cool. So, uh, Roger, most of the questions uh, came in with uh, Ro for Roger, not surprisingly, perhaps. So, so Roger, if you recovered from from that short presentation and taken a sip of water, maybe uh, we can handle a couple of these questions. Okay. Let's start off with um, how long did it take you to set this up and uh, and see some business advantages of of doing so. Uh, have you been going at this for quite a while, or or is it a fairly new development? Well, we started uh, with ArcGIS Online and Server, I, th I think it was in maybe late 2013, um, which was actually before I started working at Uniman. So um, once I started, uh, I think the actual setup of the server and it, ArcGIS Online and, and getting getting things off the ground was really quick. Uh, but then coming up with the plans for like our land management data, you know, and then organizing all that information and getting it up to the server, um, that's where a lot of the time consuming work is, which is, uh, you know, pretty common even if you were just doing desktop GIS, you've got you've to know what your data is and, and QA it a bit. Okay, and, and now that you're up and running, what sort of percentage of your user base um, it, it, what sort of numbers have you got using the the system? Uh, right now we have um, up to 120 users, um, and and some of them only very sporadically use it, and some of them are you know, a handful of them are using it every day, uh, and we're going to be working this year on trying to increase the usage uh, as we roll out more of our, this land map, we're going to train all of our um, regional or uh, operations managers and like regional managers on how to use that for the strategic uh, land usage. Uh, and then I think as we uh, advance with that, we'll get some more users who want to do uh, like the, the blasting, the blast mapping like we're doing at the one plant right now. So you're finding it's a balance between kind of office use and mine site use at the moment? Is there a is there a preference there in the office or the mine site? Or uh, well, you know, with we have marketing users and sales users who are obviously uh, they're not always at the mine site, um, and so they have a, a whole separate set of challenges than the people at the mine site do. Um, and so, uh, it, I guess it depends on the level of detail. I, we found that for the um, the marketing applications getting things started for them was very quickly because usually the level of detail for the data that they use is not as great as you have at a mine site. Okay, and another question to you. They're kind of rolling in at the moment. So, um, how about uh, integration with any of the other applications that that you might be using, uh, sort of outside of the Esri suite? Is the is the use of web services um, helping you? integrate data from from other apps uh, 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 so it's a it's a better environment for sharing than desktop uh, ETL type experience that a lot of people are dealing with um, yeah it's uh, it's worked pretty well for us um, with uh, as I mentioned we, we went on that Salesforce project to try to get a little more direct integration with that that's probably our our biggest case where we had a direct integration with another uh, uh, another business system uh, some of the challenge of that is is just about the um, infrastructure IT infrastructure side so as I mentioned the, the Amazon piece is currently 
outside of our main corporate network, so that limits some of the things that we can do um, as far as connecting to other databases. Um, wow, there's quite a few. <laughs> uh, so people are uh, asking all sorts of questions right now, but I, I, I see that we're at time. Uh, maybe we'll take just one last question here. Uh, Na um, how about uh, named users exporting specific layers and data sets to use in other applications? It's a follow-up to that to that question, uh, really about integration. Um, if you want to, ex uh, so I'll just read the question: Can named users export specific layers or data sets to use in other applications, and can they export specific coordinate systems and projections? So I, gu I guess it's another question about integration and uh, some other people are mentioning acquire and uh, you know various mine site applications have, have you done any integration with with those types of apps to date um, not not through the web um, we, we we have uh, several mine site users and we've looked at um, thinking about ways that we could try to more directly integrate with that but uh, for our particular use case, some of the things that, like the, the MindSight products, like uh, like Torque, um, or the the more centralized server side, um, those solutions didn't um, make sense for us. And so, since we don't have that, having the direct integration to the the web map uh, is more challenging. Or, I mean, we can't just do the server to server kind of piece, which would be really easy. Um, I, I have heard of people having good success with other databases such as Acquire. Excellent. Actually, that's one of the ones that was asked about, so so that's good. All right, so I, I do see that we're at time. It's 10.02, so um, although the quest, several questions are still rolling in, I think we'll need to take those offline. Um, so I uh, thank you again for the panelists who joined us today uh, and for all the attendees to this mining webinar. We hope you found it useful and informative. We'll send you an email with a link to the recording shortly and just like to thank you for your attention today. Wish you a great day and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.